and welcome. I'm Johnny Langridge and we are back with another episode of Music for the Eyes from Garsington Opera at home where we draw connections between opera and other arts. I'm joined once again by Dr Imogen Tedbury. Hi there Imi. Hi Johnny, it's great to be back. <laughs> it is and this time we're going to be looking at Beethoven's only opera, Fidelio, in his 250th anniversary year. Fidelio I think is quite topical for these days as it deals with topics of liberty and truth. We're joined by some fantastic guests this week, uh, director and designer Peter Mumford and Dr Deborah Russell from the University of York. Imi, can you tell us what we're going to be looking at together? Of course. So we'll start by talking with Peter about his production for Garsington, and we'll then be zooming out to consider some other works made around the same time as Fidelio. I'll be sharing some works on paper, some of which I'm sure will be very familiar to some of you, and we'll also be speaking with Deborah about Gothic literature and drama made after the French Revolution. And we'll be concluding with thinking a bit about this opera um, and, its, and its themes of hope and what kind of hopes it can bring for us in this moment. Sounds very good. So Garsington has recently produced a performance, a production of Fidelio, um, which was performed in September 2020, directed and designed by Peter, and we will speak to him in a moment uh, about how that came into being. But to kick us off, why don't we look at the duet that opens the opera between Marzellina, the jailer's daughter, and Giacchino, the man who really, really wants to marry her. <laughs> So there we had Galina Averina as our Marzellina and Tristan Clear Griffiths as our Giacchino. And Peter, that was your production from just a few weeks ago. Um, can you tell us how it came into being? Clearly quite COVID secure. Yeah, um, yeah, it's, it's COVID secure, that's for sure. Gus and I were incredibly careful about all of that and looked after everybody very well. Three years ago, we, we, made, we made a production, a concert version of Fidelio for Paris Chamber Opera, um, which um, Dougie is also artistic director of, which was a co-production with, with Garsington. Um, and it's based very much on that. They, they were looking at their schedule uh, in despair, you know, having cancelled most of the season and trying to think what they could do. And this came up really because the style of the production that, that, that we made in Paris um, was very, very much not compromised by having to fulfill these COVID regulations. Um, it's very much in the style of <coughs> trying to bring out the individual characters um, within the piece, um, combining it with, with the orchestra and combining it with the video, video behind. So it's a kind of deconstructed version in the first place. And it was decided that that, that might be a great idea. So they, they rang me up and said, can you do it? Do you want to come and do it? And I said, yes. And we saw in that clip there, and we'll see a bit more later, um, but the orchestra, of course, is on stage and uh, there is a video backdrop. Can you tell us a bit about that? I, I wanted, I wanted the, 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 the video to, to, if you like, illustrate in particular the overtures and the transitionary moments so that you kind of travel somewhere and you travel somewhere narrative wise as well as visually and then you arrive in a place for the scene. So it, it doesn't become something which is disruptive. It's not kind of bobbing around all the time while, while there are actually scenes being played. It's providing a background in that sense. But it's also filling in lots of gaps in the narrative. You know, in this version of, of Fidelio, for, for those people who know Fidelio will know that there are quite extensive and sometimes quite long acted sequences in between the music. They, they're known as the melodramas. Um, and they're kind of quite clunky, actually. It's an interesting piece because I think Beethoven, um, I mean, the music is divine, um, but I think it's dramatically flawed. 
Um, I, I always had this theory that he saw a Mozart piece and thought I could do one of those. Um, but because he doesn't, he doesn't use recitative in the way that Mozart does, he actually jumped into an acting genre. So in terms of the opera, and I've worked on a couple of other productions with other directors on, on, on this piece, and it's always a problem. What do you do with those acted, acted sections? Because you suddenly jump into another theatrical genre to, to get through them. So in a way, the video was, for me, uh, a very useful way in this instance at Garsington to cut those, those, those melodramas and replace them with, with text on the screen combined with imagery um, that would tell you what was, go what was going on in the bits that weren't explained dramatically within the piece itself. Uh, almost every trio, quartet, quintet in the piece, nobody's talking to each other. Um, they're all just saying what's going on inside their heads. They're expressing their feelings, which is fantastic. But it, it's like a series of juxtaposition um, conversations going on because they don't talk to each other. The only time they really have a conversation is when they're in a duet. Um, so it was a very interesting way to kind of bridge those moments and actually try and butt up the music so it felt much more sung through. And I have to say, I, I, I felt very good about that. I think, I think that worked. We did it without an interval, so that was also a useful way of, of tightening it. Um, the lighting design is also very striking. Um, uh, from a layman's perspective, it's really interesting seeing these characters, as, as you say, each of them almost talking to camera, um, uh, to, to us as an audience, um, in their own individual pools of light. But I noticed, and perhaps we can look at some of the production images while you speak, um, I noticed that sometimes you place a character in a very hard box of light and other times it's a more subtle pool of light. What, what, what are the distinctions that you're drawing there as a designer? For quite some time, we, we've been using lighting to define space um, in a scenic sense. So I wanted to make, you know, obviously we didn't have any scenery in that way, but those things fulfill that role. Um, it, it's a concert version, yes, but um, I, I, I don't think it should be in a, I hate the phrase semi-staged, which some people sometimes use, because it sounds like an apology um, for not being able to do it properly. Um, and I think that, that when working in the style that we worked on this, we are doing it properly, we are creating a theatrical event. But obviously lighting does take on more than just seeing somebody's face well. It takes on, on a defining of space something one often uses without COVID reg regulations, but I wanted to feel, because from a directorial point of view, I was asking singers to present, their, to, uh, literally to present themselves almost to camera um, in, in, in a direct way, so that we see into each individual person. It's like seeing six close-ups simultaneously when you look at it as a, as a wide shot. Um, but also to get that sense of isolation in, in the sense that those characters are very much in their own kind of prisons. I mean, Florestan is in a literal prison, but they're all in their own kind of psychological prisons, emotional prisons. Um, that's true. And, and in a way, that's why, they, that's why they don't talk to each other in the quintets, I think, because they're, they're, they're kind of involved in themselves. And so lighting wise, I, I felt that that helped to emphasize it. Obviously you will have seen from the, the duet, we begin at Garsington in virtual daylight and then move into night, which is also very appropriate for the piece, but it was still possible to use lighting to define those areas. So it's kind of hard edged at the beginning. Um, in, in act two, um, you'll see, I think, I think you'll see, um, that, that it goes into a much softer feeling because in act two, they're supposed to be hardly able to see at all. They're right in a deep, dark dungeon, if you're going to be literal about it. Um, and, and so, it's a softer kind of look to try and evoke that feeling, but still actually see the singer. So it's a very simple, it wasn't, it's not a complicated lighting design for, the, for this piece, but I hope that it, it kind of evokes the style that we're, that we're going with. Hey, you, you mentioned that we're in, in daylight at Garsington at the beginning. You weren't at Garsington. Um, <laughs> and uh, I happen to know that you, you directed this and indeed lit it via Zoom. Tell us what that was like. It was very weird. I mean, th this, I was, I was lighting uh, a, a restaging of, of Madame Butterfly at Vienna State Opera. And I was en route to go there. Uh, it's, it was the Anthony Mangella production that's, that's been at ENO and at the Met. I was literally en route to Vienna 
um, a, a stopover at, at Athens when uh, the UK put Austria on the quarantine list. And my schedule was to leave after opening night, go straight to Garsington and get Fidelio on. Um, so that made that impossible because on coming back to the UK, I would have had to go into quarantine. That means I couldn't work because um, we didn't have a lot of time to get this on at Garsington. So um, went for plan B and plan B was come back to my studio here um, in, in, on Kefalonia, which is where I live and uh, set up a Zoom situation. Uh, I had two Zooms. I had my big computer and my small com a big computer showing me a wide shot of the stage. And I had a, a smaller a laptop connection to the production desk and I had a mobile phone connection to my assistant director. Then at Garsington, they set up a huge screen in the auditorium, roughly where the production desk would have been, which I appeared on. Um, so I could, I could talk I could talk to the singers and they could see me. Um, and that's how we did it. Uh, I mean, crazy, really. Uh, I mean, I was 12 hours on Zoom every day. Um, 12 hours on Zoom. I don't think any of us, any of you that. It's a um, killer. It's a great killer. <laughs> um, can I, Peter, can I leap in here and ask you a bit more about the, the video creations that you made? Because, um, I mean, they're, they're extremely interesting. And I wanted to ask you a bit about your, your inspirations and how, how you came to create these. They're very striking visually. Well, thank you, thank you. That's that's good, good. When I knew that we were doing the production in Paris, um, and I and I decided I was going to create a, a continuous um, video background for it, I kind of start collecting material, and I would just every time I saw something that I thought I might use, I would I would grab it. Um, obviously, particular things. Um, so I did the same thing really with this, and I gathered material, some from the docks, from from the prison, some natural material, and then put that all together. So I've got a library of material to work from, and then I work with with Will Reynolds, my editor, and and put the whole thing together, but also treat it. So you you take it, you take the material. I don't want it to look like a documentary. Um, I, I want it to look a little bit, um, if you like, artier than that. Um, yeah, collected it from all sorts. Just looking at the images in your video creations, Peter, they really remind me of this new experience of captivity that is presented by the prince of someone like Piranesi. Um, I'm sure many of you all know his series of imaginary prisons uh, that were first issued in around 1749, 1750, and then reappeared after some substantial reworking in 1761. Um, Piranesi is of course also very well known for his vedute, his views of Rome. He was an architect and archeologist as well as a printmaker. But these prints, really transform the visuals of prisons in our collective imagination um, from this time onwards. Um, previously, prisons were represented as, as structures with sort of cages and bars, and these open it up in a completely different way. These are, these are cavernous structures. We don't know the boundaries of them. They could be cities even, these sort of underground um, cistern-like catacombs even. And this image I'm showing you here is the frontispiece um, from the series and, and shows us Piranesi's signature um, in, in text form here. And you can see some of the play that's already going on with the relationship between figures and sculptural grotesques who occupy this, these buildings, uh, these interiors, as decoration rather than as people, as prisoners. The figure, for example, who is sitting among chains over the top of Piranesi's signature here, it's unclear whether this is a sculpture or whether this is a man. And certainly the, the contrast and scale between this figure and the other figures who are watching over this scene from the bridge on the upper right, it makes the whole thing very ambiguous. This is even more clear in a second image that I'm showing you here. This is the man on the rack uh, who is in, occupies the, the lower part of the composition. He's being turned on the rack by another figure on, on the lower part. You can see uh, the muscles in this man's arms as he pulls down on the lever that is uh, elongating um, the poor soul's torture. But other figures, other faces, other images in this scene are rather more ambiguous. The medium of engraving allows for this slippage between sculpture and 
um, human form in these interiors. We had these huge colossal faces um, in relief occupying these triumphal arches, more viewers looking down on the scene from above, and a figure who stands on what seems to be the ruins of a classical column uh, leaning over our poor tortured soul. Unclear if this is a sculpture or a man. It's unclear even among the people who seem to definitely be men in many of these images whether they are prisoners or whether they are guards, whether they are visitors to the prison. And this ambiguity really sums up some of the ways that writers and radicals were, were starting to think about using prisons and imprisonment as a way for thinking about society. Um, Rousseau's social contract is, is a little bit later, but these ideas are still already in play. This idea that in order to participate in society, we give up some of our freedoms and we receive in return some protections from the state, from the monarchy. Um, and you can see from this image I'm showing you just how inspirational these prints have been uh, since their first um, circulation among visitors of the Grand Tour to Rome in the 18th century. Um, you know, echoes of Metropolis and Blade Runner, even the, the moving staircases of Hogwarts, perhaps. Um, I don't know if, if these images were, were part of your thinking as well, Peter. I, th I think it's really interesting because i'm beginning to realize that some kind of subconscious thing must have been going on with me because i i wasn't thinking of piranesi when 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 i started work, working on this but um back in about 1980 something like that i designed a production of fidelio for opera north and there i did specifically use piranesi i don't know if you can see this i shall hold it up i found it uh can you see that Oh yeah, right. Yeah. And I, I very much I, I have some pictures of the design, but very much based the design on on that, which which was the sepulchral chamber of the freedom, freedmen. Um, just because I really liked it. Uh, so maybe some of that was in. I mean, when I was thinking about in particular the video, I was thinking more about Bunuel and Dali and and film noir, and I think that was because we were doing it in Paris, probably. You know, um, got to do something a little bit Parisian. Um, but, but it's interesting, because um, I hadn't thought about the Piranesi thing until, until you mentioned it, but of course, that was the very first Fidelio I did. I based quite closely on, on that mausoleum. Um, and if I put the deepest, darkest um, dungeon on top of it, um, yeah. that's another story. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. Right. I mean, I think um, your, your dungeons, which you have in the video montages for, for this production, are maybe kind of closer to something like the Bastille. I mean, not the yeah. Not I mean, they're, again, they're a collage. They're a collage of images yeah. and, you know, and and bits of this and bits of that, and then Leonora's face um, appearing in that. You know, when when mm. he starts fantasizing about her in his mm. story. Um, so yeah, uh, really interesting. It, it's really interesting how people make those those connections, and and they go, yeah, well, oh, oh yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, it just completely changed the way that the way that we think about prisons in our kind of collective imagination, if you like. Um, and certainly in, in the 18th century, prisons were a way of thinking about the um, the the social contract. Um, you know, this idea that we are all. Um, yeah, the social contract, you know, we, we all give up some aspect of our freedom uh, in order to benefit from the, the protection of the state. And I think maybe well maybe actually this is a great moment to bring in bring in Deborah Dr Deborah Russell who's a lecturer at the um, University of York in 18th century literature and Deborah is a specialist in Gothic literature and drama, um, and I'm hoping that Deborah will, will be able to tell us a bit more about the connections between drama and literature with um, this revolutionary moment in the the late 18th early 19th century. Um, hi Deborah. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, could you tell us a bit about the kind of connections between um, works of art like Fidelio, um, like some of the literature you work on, and, and the French Revolution, the kind of fall of the Bastille? Yes, uh, of course. So, well, the first thing to say is that when Horace Walpole was writing The Castle of Otranto in the 1760s, um, which is often kind of thought of, um, often referred to as the first Gothic novel, Walpole at that stage said that he was very glad to think of anything rather than politics. So with that sense, 
the Gothic was thought of, and at that time, the Gothic was thought of as quite kind of escapist perhaps. But then by the time you get to the end of the century, so after the French Revolution in, in 1789, after the kind of explosion uh, of popularity of the Gothic in the 1790s, at that point, the Marquis de Sade could claim that the Gothic was the necessary fruit of the revolutionary tremors felt by the whole of Europe. Um, so what de Sade's talking about there is partly about the sense that when the world is violent and tumultuous and, and in a state of upheaval, literature kind of has to get more extreme to capture people's, people's attention. Um, so this kind of shock value to the Gothic um, that's, that's just about um, kind of popularity in this in this extraordinarily um, tumultuous period. Um, but it's also true, I think, that the Gothic or or works that kind of draw on the Gothic, even if they're not kind of outright Gothic, so Gothic images and settings and ideas, um, that that's particularly well suited for thinking through and, and responding to that, that upheaval. So, you know, the Gothic is centrally interested in, in fear, in, in systems of power and oppression, um, in, in hidden and, and buried and inherited wrongs kind of coming to light and coming back to haunt us. Um, and there's also a real kind of sense in, in, in this period that the Gothic isn't escapist anymore, that the real world has gone Gothic. You know, you see a lot of commentators using the imagery of the Gothic to describe the happenings of the revolution. So someone like Edmund Burke describes revolutionaries as furies of hell. Those, those kind of images come up, come up a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of connection is, is particularly true of, of, of prison fictions for, for all the reasons that, that, that you know, you've just been, been talking about. So works that focus on the prison as a space, as a setting and, and, and as an, an institution um, kind of really link kind of gothic ideas. You get prisons described as a grave or as being buried alive a lot and this, this political context. Um, and really that's because of, of, of the Bastille um, as, as, as a prison. Um, so the storming of, of the Bastille um, on, on the 14th of July, 1789, that's one of the key events that, that kicks off the French Revolution. And it, it as an event, it becomes a really powerful symbol of, of the revolution as a whole. Um, so the Bastille is, is an image of old systems of, of power and, and, and oppression. Um, so under the, the Ancien Regime, so before the revolution, um, the kind of, it had 30 meter high towers and they loom over Paris. Um, and you can be imprisoned there without trial solely on, on, on the kind of orders of, of, of the king um, uh, via Lettre de Cachet. Um, so when the, the Bastille falls, its fall kind of symbolizes that revolutionary political upheaval, so the tearing down of old systems of power. Um, and that means that any texts that, that focus on prisons can very easily make their audience think about that, that context um, and think about all the political questions um, and that that come along with the revolution and all the fears that come along with the revolution as well. Um, and I think, you know, that's basically what troubles the, the early censors of, of Beethoven's opera in, in 1805 when it runs into trouble with the censors and changes have to be made. It's because they're worried that it'll remind people of, of the fall of, of the Bastille. Um, and you see those images of, of, of prisons and liberty and oppression being worked through um, really in, in a variety of, of, of texts in this, in this period. That's very interesting. So prisons and this kind of um, carceral imaginary, it's not just window dressing, it also it has or maybe is seen to have um, a, a political significance as well. But something like Fidelio really transplants this action to, you know, as far away as possible um, from uh, the fall of the Bastille and the terror in, in that way. Um, do you think these these works are deliberately political or are they trying to are they using the kind of dressings of politics to to make good drama yeah well that move of kind of distancing the 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 action in in time and in place is really common in in the gothic and it lets you get away with 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 a bit more i think if you can explore these images in a society that you're saying is, is not our society it's distanced kind of from us um i mean in terms of of the kind of political agenda and in terms of how these works use the political resonances um that might that might uh, come up via this setting. Um, it really depends on, on the drama or depends on the work of, of literature. Um, 
But of course, no work is produced in, in a vacuum. You can't just escape from a context and particularly not a context as kind of all pervasive as, as this, this revolutionary context. Um, so different, different works explore that, that, that context in, in different ways. Um, and the, the, I mean, the other really important thing to say about, about drama is that theatrical productions also have to contend with increased levels of censorship. Um, so works have to be passed by the censors, you know, because the theatre is a, a potentially dangerous space for the for the authorities um you know you have crowds of people present you know ready for their emotions to be kind of heightened and stirred up um so you don't want that being whipped up into into anything dangerous so i think theatrical productions in particular have to be slightly more oblique with their politics have to you know perhaps make those kind of slightly distancing moves um but the images are still are still you know incredibly incredibly evocative um for for a contemporary audience no, thank you. Um, maybe I can also ask you at this moment um, a bit about a bit about gender and how how gender kind of plays into this. And we, you know, when we think of gothic dramas and gothic literature, we often think about these sort of damsels in distress being being rescued. But Fidelio is, of course, a completely different um, model for that. And I'm sure that maybe Peter will have some things to say about Leonora as a kind of feminine hero as well. But maybe I'll, um, Deborah, if I can ask you first um, about about Leonora, how how unusual is she as a heroine at this time? Yeah, I mean, I think I think she is unusual, and I think it's it's worth kind of remarking on the fact that we get this this female rescuer, um, not completely unheard of, interestingly. Um, so I think it's important to say that the Gothic is always about fear, um, and that includes kind of fear of of gendered oppression. Um, but it is it's it's also about fantasy, um, and you know, including fantasies of, of female agency, perhaps. Um, and then you get other texts that flip the script more radically. Um, a novel like Charlotte Dacre's The Floya, for example, gives us a protagonist, Victoria, who, who is a rapist and a murderer. Um, so the Gothic is, is quite a good space for, for exploring gender roles and, and their transgression. Um, so kind of in that context, I can think of a couple of other examples of, of female rescuers um, specifically. Um, so there's there's an early almost forgotten now novel uh, from the 1780s called called Castle of Mowbray um, by Martha Harley um, and in that the princess Isabella kind of dons military gear and, and leads an attack to rescue her husband from uh, from confinement from imprisonment um, and then the one that's perhaps most uh, closely aligned um, uh, for us is is Joanna Bailey's uh, play The Dream. Um, so that's from 1812. Um, and interestingly, it, it, the, the character there is also called Leonora. Um, and so in that play, she rescues General Osterloo from prison, um, only actually to have him die of fear afterwards. But that's that's another story. Um, so she she kind of dresses up as a man to, to do that. And, and Bailey has, has Leonora declare that, that as she's doing it, she feels an energy within her that bids defiance to fear. Um, so I think there is, you know, there, there, there are these other examples kind of out there and it's part of a, a general, I think, um, play with, with, with gender roles um, that, 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 that the Gothic enables or that works that touch on the Gothic perhaps enable. Um, it, is, it is interesting to think about how, how those female rescuers are, are, are depicted though, you know, how, how, how radical are they as, as, as figures? Um, so there's, uh, there's a real fear from, from conservatives in this period, particularly in response to the French Revolution about, about masculine women, as, as they would call it. Um, and that again, th that disruption of gender behavior gets linked to revolutionary behavior, uh, revolutionary ideas. So um, you see kind of British cartoons and things like uh, Isaac Cruikshank's uh, A Revolutionary Bell, for example. Um, th those, those satires show, show revolutionary women being unfeminine, um, being, being violent, um, being kind of frightening and threatening. So there is, there's a kind of conservative fear of a disruption of gender roles in the period. Um, so it's worth thinking about how uh, Bailey or Beethoven might be might be kind of um, dealing with that that context. Um, you know that they're quite careful not to have their women overstep 
the boundaries of acceptable femininity completely. Um, you know, they're they're active and, and they're inspiring and they're kind of brilliant characters in, in lots of ways, but it is also important that they're motivated by love and, and duty. Um, um, you know, there's there's a, a strong emphasis on that, that this is an acceptably kind of feminine motivation. Um, and that means perhaps they're not quite as much of a threat to, to you know, what might have been thought of as the, the kind of natural order of, of, of things. Maybe that's a good opportunity there to return to our production, that idea of radical hope, banishing fear and willing that that final flicker of, of hope will remain, I think probably opens us up perfectly to watch the beautiful aria Kom Hoffnung uh, from Fidelio at the end of Act One, where Leonora is really stealing herself, again in disguise, but this is a moment of intimacy, I think, with the audience, where we see her preparing to rescue her husband from imprisonment. This is Catherine Broderick in the role uh, at Garsington in September 2020. Watching this today now sitting here really brings a tear to the eye and um, it really gets me gets me thinking again about the ways that light and um, sources of light are used symbolically in, in Fidelio um, this this idea of, of hope as a shining star something to guide Leonora to her love um, this these contrasts of light and dark good and bad, freedom and imprisonment. These ideas are sort of around, not only in Fidelio, of course, but throughout artworks of this time. I mean, I'm showing you here, William Blake's Albion, um, also known as Glad Day. Uh, this is a, a fantastic image of Albion, who's a, an allegory for England um, on the dawn of a new era. Um, William Blake was a real radical, but this is a very hopeful image. This is, the beginning of a new time, a new world. 
uh, our, our man Albion here is stretching his arms extremely wide, as sort of wide as you can go. He's at the most unbound that you can be, stretching his arms out in welcome to the sun that is rising behind him. Or is it exuding from him? There's a kind of clever ambiguity here, I think, between whether this is a, a sunrise or whether um, Albion is somehow um, causing this light to, to appear um, in his hopeful um, expectation of a new beginning. This is in some ways a very political image. Um, Blake is part of a, a revolutionary group after the French Revolution um, among some English radicals, Godwin, Mary Wollstonecraft, um, Thomas Burke, um, thinkers who were being published by a press who Blake was working for as an engraver. Um, and they believed that in order to have a new beginning, a new hope, you needed to break from the past um, and do something radical like Leonora, perhaps. I mean, having had all of these conversations, you know, hearing about revolution from Deborah and, you know, talking to Peter about the, the themes in this opera, I, I just, I'm struck by the question that I think I pose to myself every time I see Fidelio of the lengths that this woman is going to, to save her husband. And what I'd like to ask both of you, Peter and, and, and Deborah, is uh, are these, all of these stories we're talking about, are, are these desperate times calling for desperate measures? You know, are these extraordinary people? Or actually, is there a bit of Leonora in all of us? Deborah? Yeah, I mean, well, one of the things that I think is interesting actually about this opera is that it leaves a certain amount kind of open to the audience or over to the audience to, to think about. So you've got all the kind of ideas of oppression and injustice that are set up by the situation at the beginning. Um, you know, that part of the opera might be thought of as, as quite radical in its exploration of corruption and oppression. Um, you know, there is Florestan a great criminal or does he just have great enemies? Those kind of things. Um, then you've got the 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 end of the opera um, when uh, when Don Fernando shows up, it kind of reassures us that this is all the work of, of one bad apple. You know, it wasn't the state's fault. Um, and that might leave us thinking that we just need to, to trust the authorities to put everything right in the end. Um, but I think there is a real question for us as the audience about whether that actually does kind of answer all the questions um you know how do those two things balance out um is 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 that a kind of workable workable solution if the if the prison has become a kind of symbol of the of the of the abuse of of power um you know does some unease about that linger about the systems that would enable this to happen. Um, and what I think might be quite inspiring is the way that we're kind of aligned with Leonora in trying to uncover these truths and put them right. Um, and, 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 you know, uh, yeah, correct the injustices um, and, and shed light on the darkness, all of those, all of those kind of things. Um, so in that interpretative challenge to the audience, there is also perhaps something kind of, you know, inspiring that, that, that actually what action is 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 needed um or that, that you know an individual can do something um those those kinds of things um perhaps and peter do you do you think that we all have a well of hope that can tide us through really difficult times i think it's always surprising when you see people thrust into a completely alien and perhaps threatening situation. And it's always surprising how much people are capable of, of reacting. Something comes out in people, you know, when they're suddenly confronted, I don't know, with something like a car crash or um, so, some huge event, some perhaps, perhaps a hurricane or, or all kinds of things like that, where people will suddenly pull out something which you would never have suspected was in there. So yeah, I do, I do think that that, that that quality or that ability um, is is somewhere in a in most if not all of us um, once they're confronted I mean it's a pretty extreme situation to suddenly find you know your husband um, whipped away in dead of night you don't know where he's gone but you do know that there's been certain things going on so you have an idea about it you have an idea that that it's something to do with the political situation I mean there are lots of situations like that in terms of political prisoners now that you can make that and people react in 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 ways that you'd never have imagined them capable of so i, I think I, I think i think what the leonora part does it, it illustrates that it illustrates that ability 
not so much that that she was necessarily an amazing, extraordinary, unique person that there's only one of, um, but that that quality can be drawn out in people. Well, it's been a huge pleasure talking to both of you, Peter and Deborah. Thank you so much for joining us to to talk through uh, Fidelio and all of the surrounding uh, topics that we've that we've just discussed. Uh, Amy, it's good to be back. Great to be back. Yeah, thank you so much, Deborah and Peter. Uh, it's been just so wonderful talking about this opera and these works with you. And you can enjoy Peter's production of Fidelio from Garsington Opera in full on Opera Vision. So uh, head over there. It's available for six months until March 2021. And we will be back, won't we, Imi, uh, in the coming months uh, with another episode of Music for the Eyes. And it has been a great pleasure. Thank you so much for watching. And we will leave you now with uh, a clip towards the end of the opera where Leonora is reunited with Floristan. And they talk of or Naaman Laws of Freude, um, nameless or boundless joy. Um, Catherine Broderick again here as Leonora and Toby Spence as Floristan. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 